Welcome to our online lecture series on Macbeth. Today we are going to discuss in detail a portion from Act 4, Scene 1 of the play. The section starts from line 48 onwards where we find that uh, Macbeth has come to meet the weird sisters, the three witches, once again to know more about his future as he is very much concerned about his future after his encounter with the ghost of Banco. And in this scene, the witches were present beforehand and uh, they had been performing some supernatural rites uh, in the presence of their superior Hecate. On entering the stage, Macbeth addresses the witches directly and says, How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? As Macbeth sees them performing something with a cauldron in which uh, a potion is boiling, so he asks, uh, what is it that you are doing? And he calls them secret black and midnight hags. Hags is uh, a derogatory term for a old woman, an old woman or a witch. The witches all reply together, a deed without a name. They mean to say that uh, what we are doing does not have a name proper in the language of the human beings. It is something which is unfamiliar, which is uh, unfamiliar to the human beings who are unaccustomed to such deeds and therefore this deed does not have any particular name. Then Macbeth very forcefully uh, requests, he rather urges the witches to tell him more about his future irrespective of the consequences in both the natural and the human world. He says, I conjure you by that which you profess. However you come to know it, answer me. I demand an answer from you irrespective of the source of your knowledge and uh, I conjure you, I, I invoke you and I urge you, I request you to tell me if you have the capacity, if you have the power of which you profess, of which you often advertise. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, and I do not care whether the things that you are going to tell me have uh, adverse impacts, adverse effects on the natural world. It doesn't matter to me if your, f if your uh, foretelling, if your uh, prediction unties or disturbs the winds and uh, raises a severe storm which can harm the churches. Though the EST waves confound and swallow navigation up. Here navigation actually means uh, ships. And EST waves, it actually means uh, easty or foamy waves. Uh, waves which uh, gather foams because of uh, their turbulence, because of their constant clashes with one another. I do not care if the foamy waves of the sea confound or destroy and swallow or devour up ships that are uh, floating on the sea. Though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, bladed corn uh, signifies an unripe corn which is seethed, which is covered by the blades or the leaves uh, of the particular uh, particular uh, tree or particular herb. Uh, I do not care if uh, crops are destroyed and if trees are uprooted or trees are um, trees are destroyed, trees are blown down uh, through 
your predictions uh, as an impact as an effect of your predictions i do not care what destruction your predictions are going to bring in nature though castles topple on their warders heads though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations and i also do not care about the impacts of your predictions on the human on the man made world it doesn't matter to me if man made castles collapse or topple down on the heads on the bodies of their warders or on, on the bodies of their guards though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations though stately palaces and pyramids also collapse and uh, turn into a heap of debris a heap of mass around their foundation stones though the treasure of nature's germans tumble all together even till destruction sicken or i do not also care much about the destruction of everything that nature has to offer for the nourishment of all the creatures even if all the germans even if all the seeds of nature tumble all together or become destroyed become huddled together and uh, seize their ability to germinate sees their ability to procreate something new till destruction itself gets tired of its uh, massive work massive work of destruction and harm that it brings to the human and the natural world i do not care about all the possible consequences that your predictions might uh, bring that your predictions might cause i just want to know the answer to my question then he says answer me to what i ask you the witches consecutively reply saying speak demand will answer the first second and the third witch uh, replies consecutively that speak demand will answer then the first witch tells say if doubt to rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters so the first which uh, offers macbeth a choice whether he would like to hear the answers from the witches themselves or would he like to hear it from the masters the superiors of the witches macbeth uh, chooses the latter option he says call him let me see him so call your superiors if you have any and i would like to see them i would like to hear from them and the first witch then tells the other two witches to do some ritualistic activities she says pour in soul's blood that hath eaten her nine pharaoh grease that sweaten from the murderer's gibbet throw into the flame so uh, she tells the two other witches to throw some ingredients into the magical potion the first ingredient is the blood of a sow or swine or a pig which has eaten up its own nine offspring its own uh, youngs its own children grease or uh, the moisture that sweaten that uses to moisten up that uses to um, make the gallows make the post from which a criminal is hanged uh, sweaten or um, more moisturized so that grease is to be thrown into the magical potion in order to uh, in order to bring forth what we want to appear in front of us then all the witches together say come high or low thyself and office deftly show so they are invoking their superior powers and they um conjure up the apparitions which uh, they present in front of macbeth then there is thunder 
and the first apparition appears. This apparition is an armed head, a head of a soldier or a king which has a crown or a helmet on its head. Then Macbeth commands that apparition, tell me, thou unknown power, but he cannot uh, complete, he cannot finish his speech, the first which interrupts him and says, he knows thy thought, the apparition which is in front of you is aware of uh, your thought, is aware of your queries, hear his speech, but say thou not. You should merely listen to what it has to say and you should not uh, speak to it. The first apparition says, Macbeth, 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 beware Macduff, beware the train of five, dismiss me enough. And saying this much, the apparition descends. So the first apparition cautions Macbeth about Macduff, who is the train of five. And, uh, we have already come to know that uh, Macduff willingly uh, abstained from attending the banquet thrown by Macbeth to celebrate his coronation. And uh, Macbeth had his suspicions about Macduff. He thought that Macduff must have suspected him of regicide and also the murder of Banco and uh, he feared that Macduff might avenge him as a rightful and righteous servant of the former king. So Macbeth says, whatever thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. <coughs> I thank you, though I do not know who you exactly are, but whatever thou art, whatever you are, uh, for the good caution, for the beneficial words of warning, I thank you. Thou hast helped my fear aright. You has, sorry, you have uh, touched upon the same cause of fear that are already in my mind. But one word more, but I have uh, some more queries. Uh, here again, Macbeth is interrupted by the first witch, who says, he will not be commanded. This apparition will not uh, abide by your commands. Here is another, we are presenting another apparition, more potent than the first, and this one is uh, stronger, this one is more potential than the first one. Then there is again thunder, the second apparition, a bloody child. A bloody child means uh, the image of a child whose body is smeared with blood. This second apparition also addresses Macbeth saying Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth and Macbeth rather ironically and with uh, a tinge of humor says had I three years I would hear thee. So as you were calling me thrice uh, I think I uh, needed three years to uh, properly listen to what you have to say to properly respond to you. Then the second apparition says, Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Love to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. The second apparition says, Be bloody. Here, bloody might mean either full of blood, full of uh, physical strength, and it may also mean um, brutal, ruthless, so the epithet bloody may mean both um, full of blood and uh, full of cruelty. Bold, be courageous and resolute, be very determinate, be very uh, resolute, be very confident in your opinions, in your activities. Love to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. You should scorn, you should uh, laugh at the powers of human beings because nobody who is born of a woman will be able to harm you, will be able to kill you or to cause any harm to you. Then it descends. And Macbeth uh, says, Then leave Macduff, what need I fear of thee? Then uh, on hearing the caution from the second apparition, 
Macbeth says that uh, if none of women born can harm me, then why should I kill Macduff? You can live forever because I do not have anything to fear from you. But yet I will make assurance double sure and make a bond of fate. But still Macbeth is uh, so clever that he doesn't want to miss any chance. He doesn't want to take any risk. He says, though I am assured that uh, nobody who is born of a woman will be able to cause any harm to me, I do not want to take risks. I want to make this supernatural assurance double sure by terminating, by eliminating Macduff. And take a bond of fate. Though I know what uh, lies in my future, though I know about my destiny, I want to make a treaty, I want to make a legal bond with my destiny, with my fate, so that my destiny can never betray me. Thou shalt not live. This is uh, apostrophically addressed to Macduff. Macbeth says that Macduff, you will not live. I cannot permit you to live, though I uh, know from the supernatural powers that uh, it is beyond your power to harm me. Thou shalt not leave, you will not leave. That I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. Here fear has been personified and the, the compound adjective pale-hearted is uh, an example of hyperlage or transferred epithet. Pale-hearted uh, should actually have been applied to the person who is uh, stricken by fear. As if uh, the fear makes someone's heart pale, someone's heart bloodless. So the pale-hearted fear, here fear itself is not pale-hearted, but fear causes a person to be pale-hearted or of uh, weak-hearted. And Macbeth says that uh, I want to make a treaty with my destiny and I must terminate Macduff so that I may tell that my fears are lying to me, that my fears are baseless, they are, uh, they are untrue fears and I can sleep in spite of thunder. Even if there is turbulence in the outside world, be it the natural world or be it the political ambience of the state, I can sleep peacefully. Then there is thunder and a third, appear, a third apparition appears. This is a child crowned, a child with a golden crown, golden um, headgear on its head, with a tree in his hand. And Macbeth is quite uh, amazed to see such an apparition and asks, what is this that rises like the issue of a king? So what is this apparition? which is uh, arising out of the cauldron, like the issue, like the child or son or inheritor of a king, and wears upon his baby brow the round and top of sovereignty. The round and top of sovereignty, in fact, means uh, crown. It is uh, a complex metonymy for crown. The round refers to the shape of the crown, and the top of sovereignty because uh, um, someone who holds sovereign power as the king has the right to wear a crown on his head. So Macbeth's question is uh, what this apparition actually stands for. He is uh, wearing, he, he looks like the issue or the successor of a king and he wears the crown which is a symbol of sovereignty on its head, on its baby head, on its baby brow. Because, uh, because the head of the child is very small, the crown seems to have uh, descended onto its brow, onto its uh, forehead. Then the witches reply, listen but speak not to it. You should not speak to the apparitions, just listen to what they have to offer. Then the third apparition says, Be lion metalled proud. So this again uh, tells Macbeth to be very courageous, very bold. Be as mentally strong as a lion. 
and proud you should also be very much uh, proud very much um, arrogant and take no care who shapes who frets or where conspirators are and you should not be worried about your enemies your foes or the people who are conspiring against you you need not be bothered about who has grievances against you who shapes or who worries about you who frets who have grudges against you or who are conspiring against you who are your conspirators macbeth shall never vanquished be until great burnham wood to high dunsinane hill shall come against him and thirdly they um, refer to an impossibility without which macbeth can never be harmed they say that you will never be vanquished you will never be defeated until and unless the great barnum wood will rise to the dunsinane hill so dunsinane is the place where the royal castle is situated and barnum woods are the woodlands surrounding um, the dunsinane hill in scotland so they say that until and unless the barnum woods mount up to the hill of dunsinane you can never be defeated so you have nothing to worry about in this world then the third apparition descends and macbeth says that will never be that is um, a physical impossibility it can never happen a woodland can never mount up to a hill who can impress the forest beat the tree and fix his and fix his earthbound root because it is impossible for human beings to impress or to move the forest to cause the forest to move and who can bid who can command or who can oblige a tree to unfix to uproot its roots which are deeply seated inside the earth sweet boldments good so these are very sweet predictions sweet foretellings so far so good rebellion said rise never till the wood of burnham rise and our high placed macbeth shall leave the lees of nature pay his breath to time and mortal custom so macbeth is now relieved from his uh, former fears former anxieties and he says that uh, whoever uh, might be my rebels you must not raise your head before the woodland of barnum has the ability to rise up to dunsinane hill and high placed macbeth the macbeth who has now obtained the highest position in the state as the king will be able to leave as much as uh, nature permits him to live he will have a natural span of life he will not be killed before um, adequate old age when he will naturally die and pay his breath to time and mortal custom um, as per the custom of nature when all mortal human beings are destined to die i also am going to die at that age i cannot be killed before uh, my natural span of life has an end yet my heart throbs to know one thing and still even after all these assurances my heart throbs my heart is anxious to know one more thing tell me if your art can tell so much shall banco's issue ever reign in this kingdom so he um, asks the witches that if they can if their art is able to produce so much will it be able to tell whether banco's issue or banco's sons and grandsons will be 
able to the future rulers of this land of this state then the witches all reply together seek to know no more you must not ask for any more information from us but macbeth uh, goes on pressing them he says i will be satisfied after you deliver this last answer to my query i will be satisfied deny me this and an eternal curse falls on you and if you deny this answer to me if you refuse to answer this last time uh, an eternal curse will fall on you you will be cursed forever let me know why sings the that cauldron what noise is this so by the time he converses with the witches he sees that the magical cauldron which the witches had been using so far is descending inside earth and he hears a certain noise the stage direction says hobos hobos are loud trumpets so in the backstage there is the sound of the hobos and the cauldron descends but the magic of the witches continues the witches consecutively say one after another show 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 then all say together show his eyes and grieve his heart come like shadows so depart so they further oblige supernatural powers to appear in front of macbeth but this time note what they say they say show his eyes present uh, a view a show in front of his eyes and grieve his heart but the show the scene that is going to be presented in front of his eyes is going to grieve his heart is going to uh, sadden his heart because it will not be a pleasant sight for his eyes come like shadows so depart appear like shadows appear like um, unreal appearances and depart like them then there is a procession of eight kings a show of eight kings the last with a glass in his hand banco's ghost following so there is a procession of eight kings one after another the last one holds a glass in his hand this glass uh, might um, mean either an hour glass which symbolizes the passage of time and it might also refer to a mirror which shows <coughs> the reflections of the other characters the other shadows of kings and this procession is followed by the ghost of banco which signifies that these are the issues these are the descendants of banco but macbeth is quite appalled he's quite disturbed to see such a show such a procession and he says thou art too like the spirit of banco down you look very much like the spirit the ghost of banco down uh, i command you to descend i command you to disappear <coughs> then he continues his uh, speech he says thy crown does sear mine eyes ball my eyeballs and thy hair thou other goat sorry and thy hair thou other gold bound brow is like the first uh, so macbeth says that the crown on your head the crown on the head of uh, banco's ghost sears or it dazzles it um, scorches my eyeballs my eyes i cannot uh, tolerate such a sight that uh, you should wear the crown of the king after me and the hair um, this uh, might signify that uh, the the procession of the eight kings uh, bear the same kind of hair that resembles that of banco for which it is uh, very logical for macbeth to think that they all are the descendants of banco they all carry the same genetic features same physical features um, like banco thou other gold bound brow is like the first a third is like the former so 
all the kings one after another the eight shadowy figures of kings one after another they all bear the same physical features as their forefather Banco filthy hacks this is directed this is addressed to the witches whom Macbeth calls filthy because they are betraying his um, future ambition why do you show me this why are you presenting in front of me such a filthy sight such a nasty sight that the children of Banco that the descendants of Banco are wearing the king uh, the kingly crown a fourth start eyes so the fourth image the fourth shadow appears in front of Macbeth's eyes the first three having passed on so he sees the fourth shadow and says start eyes my eye my eyes are startled my eyes are dazzled what will the line stretch out to the crack of doom so will this lineage of kings be uh, be ceaseless will this lineage of kings last as long as the entire creation is doomed on the uh, on the day of the apocalypse will this be forever will this remain forever another yet a seventh so one after another the images of kings keep on coming and Macbeth is quite appalled to see them I will see no more and yet the eighth appears who bears a glass which shows me many more and some I see that twofold balls and treble scepters carry horrible sight <coughs> so Macbeth says that in spite of my uh, unwillingness to see them the eighth figure appears who holds a glass in his hand and which shows the reflection of many more others to come and some I see that twofold balls and treble scepters carry <coughs> The twofold balls and treble scepters signify the the scepter, a treble scepter because scepter is the the stick that is carried by a sovereign ruler by a king, and this is this scepter is treble because um, perhaps it refers to the three kingdoms of Scotland sorry not Scotland Scotland was not uh, then a free country um, Britain France and Ireland which were under one ruler at that point of time and he calls this site a horrible site <coughs> now I see it is true and then he says that now I can realize that it is after all true that my children will not be able to carry forward my kingly lineage and it will be the successors of Banco who will be the future rulers of this country now I see it is true for the blood bolted Banco smiles upon me and points at them for his then the apparition vanishes so the, the apparitions uh, vanish uh, for the blood bolted Banco smiles upon me the ghost or the apparition of Banco who is blood bolted because his hair his entire body is smeared with blood and uh, Macbeth perceives that uh, the ghost of Banco is smiling on him and he points at the procession of eight kings signifying that uh, they are going to be the future rulers of this country then Macbeth says what is this so so is this uh, going to be the ultimate reality after all the first which replies I sir all this is so yes sir everything that you see is going to be reality after all but why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? But why the great king Macbeth 
is uh, standing in such a bewildered, awestruck way. Come, sisters, cheer we up his, his sprites and show the best of our delights. Then uh, the first witch calls the other two witches uh, to present in front of Macbeth some cheerful sight, some entertaining sight, which might uh, uh, lighten his anxieties, which might uh, cheer up his mental spirit. <coughs> While you perform your antic round, that this great king may kindly say, our duties did his welcome pay. Sorry, before I missed a line before that. I will charm the air to give a sound while you perform your antic round. So the first witch uh, tells the other two witches that I will produce a musical sound while you will be dancing around Macbeth so that this great king may be kind to us and he may acknowledge that uh, we uh, did our duties very respectfully and um, that we paid him the due welcome, the due respect he is um, due, uh, who he is, uh, he is, uh, he is to be paid, he is to obtain from us. Then the, there is music and the witches dance and then they suddenly vanish along with Hecate. And um, then Macbeth notices that uh, some people are coming towards him. Uh, but uh, when Macbeth uh, sees that the witches have vanished, he says, where are they? Gone! Let this pernicious hour stand, <coughs> stand I accursed in this in the calendar. Come in without there. So uh, Macbeth is quite taken aback uh, with the sudden disappearance of the witches and says, where have they gone? Have they vanished? If it is so, then let this particular hour be cursed. Let this hour be marked in the calendar as a cursed, a doomed hour. Then he says, come in without there, as he has noticed some people approaching him. Uh, it is only, not, not some people, it is only Lennox. He seems to have uh, noticed the approaching of Lennox and though he cannot recognize him fully, so he says, uh, you who are standing outside or who are out there may come in, come in without there. Then Lennox enters. Uh, on entering the stage, Lennox um, says, What's your grace's will? So, what is the will, what is the wish of your grace, uh, your highness? Macbeth says, Saw you the weird sisters? Macbeth asks Lennox, uh, Did you see the witches? Lennox. Lennox is quite uh, taken aback before he takes a uh, little time before he replies. He says, no, my lord. Macbeth says, come they not by you? Sorry, came they not by you? Uh, didn't they encounter, didn't they confront you? Lennox says, no, indeed, my lord. Then Macbeth says, infected be the air whereon they ride, and damned all those that trust them. Now, there is a very deep irony in this comment by Macbeth. While Macbeth is cursing the witches and those who believe in their words, he is actually cursing himself because he is also a believer in the predictions by the witches. He says, infected be the air whereon they ride. But the fact is that the air is already infected on which the witches ride because as we noticed in the very first few scenes of the play that what is foul, what is abominable from the human perspective is something fair, is something um, cherishable for the witches. And what is uh, what is foul or what is abominable for the witches are the good things which uh, human beings enjoy. 
So when Macbeth curses the witches saying that let the air be infected on which they roam about, um, he actually misses the point that this air is already infected, this air is already foul. He cannot, uh, his cars cannot actually turn it into something worse. And he says, damned all those that trust them. All people who trust in their words may be damned, may be cursed, may be doomed. But he himself will be doomed in the end. And unknowingly, he uh, actually curses himself, saying this. Then he says, I did hear the galloping of horse. Who was it come by? Who was it came by? So then Macbeth says that uh, I did hear the galloping, the running of a horse. Who was it who passed by? Lennox replies, "Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word. Macduff is fled to England. So Lennox says that um, two or three of us who came here to give you the message that Macduff has uh, fled to England. Macbeth is um, slightly taken aback. He says, fled to England? Lennox replies, I, my good lord, yes, my sir, my dear sir. Then there is a long speech by Macbeth in which he uh, shows his uh, determination about his future course of actions. He says, Time thou anticipest my dread exploits, the flighty purpose never is, uh, never is overtook, unless the deed go with it. So Macbeth says that he apostrophically addresses time. Uh, this speech is not uh, addressed to Lennox, who is uh, still present on the stage, but this is um, spoken out rather in the form of a soliloquy, though Lennox is present on the stage. And Macbeth says that time, you are anticipating my dread exploits, my, my fearful activities, my fearful uh, endeavors. The flighty purpose never is overtook unless the deed go with it. A purpose which is flighty, which is fleeting, is never accomplished unless it is uh, accompanied by deed, by uh, the execution of that plan, by um, a substantial deed, by a substantial physical activity. From this moment the very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. From this moment onwards my plans will be immediately executed uh, by my hands. I will not uh, let the plans remain only in my mind. I will, uh, the moment a plan comes to my mind, the next moment I shall be executing it. And even now, to crown my thoughts which ac with acts, be it thought and done, and even now, I, w I am going to crown my thoughts, I am going to award my thoughts with acts, with deeds, with uh, physical executions. Be it thought and done. The moment I think of something, I do it. The castle of Macduff I will surprise. I will um, raid. I will uh, seize the castle of Macduff. Seize upon five. I will. Um, uh, I will conduct a military seizure upon the county of five. Give to the age of the sword, his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. And then he plans for terminating all uh, who is related to Macduff. He plans to uh, kill Macduff's wife, his uh, children, and all the unfortunate souls, all the innocent people who are in some way linked to Macduff. No boasting like a fool. I will not be boasting. I will not be uh, making high talks like a fool. But I will execute my plans. This did I will do before this purpose school. 
and I must execute, I must implement this plan before the purpose, before the plan cools down, before I lose the mm, mental energy and rage to implement this plan. But no more sights. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me where they are. But where have your uh, companions gone? I did hear the sounds of several horses. Where are your other companions? Call them, bring them in. Then they both leave the stage, excellent. So here the scene ends and uh, let us stop here for today. Thank you.